The Nedbank uh, Better Beta Equally Weighted ETF gave investors a return of 31% in 2012. That's the highest amongst ETFs offering investors broad exposure to the JSE. The South African market now boasts 61 products in all forms of passive strategies up from 10 in 2007. So what's next? Noreena Fissa from Nedbank Capital joins us to share her views. Before we go to Noreena, Warren's going to give us some comparative graphs looking at the top 40, looking at the Nedbank equally weighted and the SWIX. Great, thanks Bronwyn. Uh, we just wanted to start the program off with a, a very basic graph just outlining the number of products currently in the South African market and how quickly the market's grown in terms of uh, products here. You can see back in 2007 we had 10 products. The dark bars are the ETFs, those are the products that have uh, physical uh, shares behind them or in the case of commodities they have the physical metal behind them. Uh, and then you can see from 2010 we started seeing the arrival of the exchange traded notes which are products uh, written on the back of uh, banks' balance sheets that promise to give a performance in line with a commodity or a fixed income uh, metric or an equity basket of some sort. So here we are now at 61 products in 2012 with about 48 billion uh, of assets under management. If we go to the next, uh, the next graph, we can see who the big players in the market are in terms of the number of uh, products. ABSA still leads the way and their new gold product is responsible for a lot of the 21 billion that sits in their funds. Just a, a last look at, uh, at the third Warren, graph. Uh, Warren, before we change graphs there, I'm just going to ask you to go through the top five on that graph that we've just seen because we can't actually see it from a size perspective. Just read us the, the top couple. Uh, okay, great. So with, uh, we're talking number of uh, ETPs here, uh, uh, which is exchange traded products, including the exchange traded notes and exchange traded funds. We've got ABSA Capital. Uh, Satrix managers at second, Deutsche Bank with their uh, international trackers at third, uh, the Standard, uh, whoops, sorry, we've got Rand Merchant Bank at number five, uh, and Standard Bank with uh, all the exchange traded notes that they've issued uh, as one of the big players there. Um, if we just turn, turn to the next graph, uh, uh, we can just talk about Narina's product specifically. That 31% was a great, uh, great return for one year. And you can just look here, it's probably a little bit too small on the screen, but just in terms of the idea of the equally weighted uh, index, it's quite different from its peers in the top 40 in the SWIX. If I just take one example here with regards to brewers, that would be SAB Miller. In the top 40, it makes up 11% of the portfolio. In the SWIX, 35 and in the equally weighted 2.7. So uh, it just gives a different orientation around the same stocks uh, in that top 40 universe. Uh, but what we want to get uh, from uh, Narina today is where is this market going? Are we going to see more products in our space? Can I take one step back before sure. we get there and look at <coughs> ETN's exchange traded notes and exchange traded funds and the difference? Remember talking to lay people out here? Sure, sure. I think um, Warren uh, covered it quite well in his introduction in the sense that exchange traded funds typically have got physical assets that underpin it and certainly in the South African market that is a requirement of the FSB the majority of the exchange traded funds in our market are also registered as collective investment schemes so your run of the mill unit trust that most investors are familiar with those are also the, the major um, sort of basis for most of the ETFs in our market ETNs on the other hand are these promissory notes so it's, a, it's an issuing bank that offers balance sheet writes to the investor an, a promise that he will give him the performance of some reference asset. Now what we need to understand here is that it doesn't mean that there is not necessarily physical assets that underpin it but it is the responsibility and the risk of the um, issuing bank to determine how are they going to manage that risk. So you might find that there are actually physical assets whether it be equities or commodities, gold, platinum, whatever that underlies all of that but as far as the investor is concerned he's credit exposure or his risk exposure is with the issuing bank and that's probably the biggest difference I didn't between mean to the say two. you hadn't done a good job <laughs> but I just I just wanted Marina to take it one step further as well yeah. so the 31 percent return this is what Warren I is saying uh, you must be when you when you're at the top it's very difficult to go anywhere but down that's quite stressful right now not really you know as a, as a passive investor we sleep very well at night because we don't have to make these these decisions um, but that being said you know um, looking at past performance as with any other fund really is no indication of where it will go in future. I think a lot more important is to look at why did we get that performance, where did it come from and what does the future look like on that basis. And I think that is why your last slide in terms of what is the 
makeup of those different sectors, stocks and so on in the different uh, portfolios of the three different types of, of top 40 based ETFs, how do they compare and that's what's really important about it. Because return is also just one aspect of performance. Risk is just, if not a more important aspect of performance and that was not even mentioned and although the, the better beta equally weighted had the highest return, it also has the lowest risk and for us that is a much more important point of focus. Why well, does that's it have perfect. a perfect low, <laughs> low risk, high return? <laughs> what more could an investor want? And this, no. uh, this is the question I wanted to ask you, Narina. The only I think really dawned on me when I looked at that index now. So was that equally weighted idea where you take the, the, the top 40 shares and weight them equally more a risk measure to prevent some of the excesses that we've seen in the market over the last year where retailers can go up almost infinitely and contrastingly with uh, resources that seem to, to, go, to go down infinitely as well. Definitely. So it's not a view on a particular sector or stock that we like it or don't like it. It rather is a risk measure that says, you know what, once you've really taken the assumption that the top 40 shares in the market are the best and the blue chip and the, and the biggest and the most liquid that are out there, you don't want to prejudice your performance in favor of one that happens to have a bigger market cap or size relative to another one. Because unfortunately, because of the size bias that we have in our market. We've got a very small number of shares, oh, sorry, a small number of shares but make up a big portion of the market cap and therefore also contribution to performance. And that is really where your risk comes from because if we look at the makeup of the market cap weighted top 40, we see that BHP Billiton and SAB Miller, for example, jointly make up 25% of that index. So for every 100 Rand that the investor puts into a market cap weighted top 40 ETF, so something like the Satrix 40, for example, example means 25 rand of your 100 rand is used to buy just those two, two companies right. at the tail end you've got 10 companies out of the top 40 so a quarter of the companies that have got to share six rand amongst them so the problem is that it doesn't matter how good or bad any of those companies perform the contribution to performance is negligible okay how does the SWIX contrast to that? Because I think for a lot of people, they hear this SWIX word, but they don't quite understand what it's all about. SWIX is an acronym that stands for Shareholder Weighted Index. And the idea behind that is that because so many of the large companies on the JSE are dual listed companies that also have a big um, listing in London in particular, and some of them in Switzerland and so on, the idea is what proportion of those shares are actually held in South Africa by South African investors. So if we look at something like BHP Billiton, for example, example, only about 20% of its shares are actually held in South Africa on the JSE by South African investors, right. yet it's, it's got this huge market cap in our top 40 index. When British American Tobacco changed from being an inward dual listed company mm -hmm. to also qualifying for the index, the JSE started treating it differently in the indices and they said, hang on, we can't actually include this big massive company, which really is the biggest company on the JSE. We can't include that at its full market cap weight in the, the top 40 or in other, other indices, we can only include the shares that are actually on the JSE, which was 11% of its shares. Just taking a and step back. And therefore a much lower uh, weight. Sorry to go back to the, the no, ETN, sure. ETF, but the, the share institutional retail investors, what interest are we seeing from both sides of the coin here? Well, I think, you know, where internationally you certainly see institutional players being the biggest um, sort of drivers of growth in ET, ETPs. Um, so so both, and both ETFs, yes. In South Africa, the experience has been very different. Here, it's been mostly driven by retail investors, and I do believe that it fundamentally comes down to access to investment products, because the majority of your institutional investors would access investments either via a linked investment service provider, so a list platform, or they would invest in a segregated, segregated mandate directly with the issuer. So no need for them really to go the direct ETF route. Also, when you look at the cost of actually issuing an ETF in South Africa, it definitely is more cost effective to go the ETN route rather than the ETF. It's more regulatory onerous to do it for the issuer. There's a lot more costs involved. And it's also not that efficient to manage it according to the South African regulations where we are required to hold 100% of the physical assets exactly as it is in the index basket. The usage regulations, which is what most of your European and, and many of the international 
international ETFs are managed by typically have to hold 90% of the physical assets and are allowed to do 10% of it by either synthetic replication or by sampling or those sort of techniques which makes it a lot more efficient and therefore more cost effective. Unfortunately in South Africa we're not allowed to do that and therefore the end investor loses out. And I think uh, Narina in, in the case of some commodities it's easier to do the ETN rather than actually having to physically store oil for example which uh, degrades and it can get you. A little issue. bit of a problem when you've got to start bringing barrels of oil yeah. into your Not into to your mention home. the grain yeah. and, and so on. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know about so. you but I don't have those warehouses <laughs> at the back of my property. So Narina where, where next? I mean we've got a nice wide range of uh, ETFs and ETNs covering a broad swathe of commodities, we've got African equity ETNs, we've got offshore ent ETNs, uh, ETFs actually. Where do we go next? Well, I think the important thing is that exactly what you're saying, we've got this broad range, which really means that the investor can actually build a very well diversified, balanced fund portfolio using just ETFs and even ETNs then if they show, so we st wish to. So for us, that is the next phase, that really these managed portfolios of ETFs. So it's essentially like a fund of funds or a balanced fund where the investor exposes himself according to asset classes or asset components, rather according to either stock specific bets or just investing with a manager and say manager I like you or investment house I like what you're doing take my money and do whatever is necessary so it's this interim sort of control aspect for the investor that says I don't want to go quite the onerous and expensive route of stock picking individual stocks but I also don't want to give the investment manager just blanket approval to say take my money and do as you see fit it's somewhere in between it's a very cost effective way of doing it and it's a wonderful way for um, certainly the lay investor to get involved in the stock market in a well diversified and therefore relatively low risk way.